Hello and welcome back to Foundations of Deep Learning. In this week, we will discuss recurrent neural networks. We will first start with an introduction of RNNs, where we will learn about the various types of mappings of RNNs and some example applications for each of them. Then we will discuss some important design patterns of RNNs and how we can effectively model them. Next, we will look at some of the difficulties of training these recurrent neural networks. And after that, we will also discuss how backpropagation through time can be used to compute gradients for training these recurrent neural networks. Then we will look at long short term memory networks, which are also called LSTMs. And these special types of RNNs that are capable of learning these long term dependencies. And finally, we will briefly discuss alternative recurrent neural network models that are widely used today. So let's get started. Introduction to recurrent neural networks. Okay, so if we contrast feed forward neural networks and recurrent neural networks, we can say that in feed forward neural networks, the information comes from the inputs where let's say you have inputs of fixed size, such as an image, and the input goes to a set of hidden layers and produces a single output. So the information flow is only in one direction, as you can see here, and there are no cycles. Whereas in the current neural networks, there are these cycles, and we can have loops in terms of self cycles that go from one node to the same one. And you can also have these larger, bigger loops that wrap around to the same node where it came from. So this gives us the ability to store information for some time. So the input comes in at a given time step and it will be available for computation for some time and then it fades away after a couple of time steps. So there are also these more specialized architectures such as LSTMs that we will learn about in the later videos. And these LSTMs have this ability to keep track of the information for arbitrarily long times. But in basic RNNs, we can say that we have an exponentially fading memory. So let's look at some of the properties of RNNs. RNNs allow for cycles in a connectivity graph. And as long as the information is there in the network, it provides this time context. And this gives the ability for processing any of the time series of sequences. Mathematically then, these are not just function mappings as we saw in feed forward neural networks, where we said that there is this universal function approximator theorem that tells us that we can approximate any bounded continuous function. Whereas now in recurrent neural networks, we do the same with any dynamical system. So this means that any system that has a state that we update over time. And they are more powerful than feed forward neural networks. Moreover, RNNs are also Turing complete. So for any operation that you can perform with a Turing machine, you can in theory simulate it with a recurrent neural network. However, this is difficult to implement in practice, but there are these explicit memory networks that we will discuss in the later videos. And these also enable explicit storage of information rather than this fading memory, which makes it a bit easier. Okay, so there are many types of sequence to sequence mappings that you can do with recurrent neural networks. Let's take a look at some of them in the following slides. So here you can see a one to many mapping where you have an input of fixed size, for example, an image that you pass through your network and the model then has different outputs of variable lengths. An example of this configuration is the network that is used for image captioning. We saw an example of this in the last lecture already where you have an input image which is of fixed size and this is fed into a convolutional neural network. This CNN then learns spatial features 
And these features from the last layer of the CNN are then fed into a recurrent neural network that outputs many words that describe the image. As different captions might also have different lengths, our output needs to be of variable length. And as you can see, uh, here are some examples from Andrej Karpati and Fefe Lee. Here we see the image on top here. And on the bottom, you see the captions that are generated by the network. And for example, in the first image here, the network produces man in a black shirt playing a guitar. And for this image in the bottom, it says girl in the pink dress jumping on the air and so on. So as you can see, these captions are quite accurate. And this network is able to generate these really good captions even in 2015. So the opposite of this configuration that we saw in the previous slide is the many to one mapping where you just have inputs of variable lens and the model then gives you one output. So an example of this is temporal classification application. Here we can see um, sentiment classification example where you have a sentence as an input. For instance, one can describe a movie that you may have just seen and the model needs to predict the ratings based on these sequences. For example, you can say that this movie based on this comment was four stars versus this movie that this person's described was two stars and so on. So we also spoke about another example in the previous lecture where I told you that you can also do the opposite of image captioning where you input a sentence and now you want the network to generate the image from what it infers from the sentence. So here you would use an RNN in combination with a fully convolutional GAN or generative adversarial network. You will learn about GANs in the later lectures in the following weeks. So um, another example is also activity recognition where you want to have an input video which contains multiple frames. As you know, a video is just a sequence of frames and you want to recognize what activity is being performed by a person in this video. For example, a human is performing a jumping action or a human is running and so on. So this is also a many to one mapping. Okay, so we can do also this many to many mapping where our input is of variable length, let's say like a video, which is again, a sequence of frames. And now we want to make a prediction for each frame or for each image in the sequence. So an example of this is video classification tasks. Here you have an input video and the network, for example, the network has to predict what it sees in each frames. So here you see an example on the right from the largest um, video data set that we have until now. So this is the YouTube 8M data set, which I think has about um, 450,000 hours of video and over 3,800 different classes. So the network basically has to predict, for example, which class it sees in each frame of the video. So this is also an example of many to many mapping. Okay, so another example is this many to many configuration. And in this many to many configuration, you have a variable length of input and this variable length of input gets condensed or summarized at this hidden unit that you see here. And this now gives the context for the outputs that you get at a later stage. So which is also a sequence. So here we can see that an example application of this on the right, which is the classical machine translation task. So here you have an input sentence, for example, in English, and this could be of variable length. And you want to translate this to, for example, German or French, which is now again, a different length than the input. So these models have the capacity to accept variable length sequences on the input and on the output as well. 
So on the largest speech translation data set that exists currently is from a collection of UN speeches. And because often UN speeches are translated into multiple different languages as we have many countries. So these have been, uh, they have been collecting these data over a really long time. And now this is actually one of the largest machine translation data sets that exist currently. Here's an example of how to use these networks for character level language modeling, where the network will read some sequence of characters and the network will predict what the next character will be in this sequence of text. So let's assume that we have a small vocabulary of four different letters, H, E, L, and O. And we have this example training sequence of the word hello, which now contains the letters H, E, L, L, and O. So we input these characters down at the bottom here, which is then input to the network in this so-called one hot encoding form, where you have basically a one in a particular spot and zero everywhere else. So in this example, since our vocabulary has these four letters, H, E, L, L, and O, then H is represented by four elements in this vector with one at this first slot and zeros in the other three slots. And we use the same pattern to represent all the different letters in the input sequence. So during the forward pass, what this network will do is that it will receive the letter H. This will go into the RNN unit, which will then produce the output Y hat. And here the network is making the prediction about each letter in the vocabulary that it thinks is most likely to come next. So in this time step, the correct letter was actually E as the training sequence was H-E-L-L-O, but the model is now predicting O as the most likely letter, which is incorrect. So we would use the softmax loss to quantify the error with these, um, with these predictions. So in the next time step, we would now feed the second letter of the training sequence, which is E as input to this unit, and we will repeat the process. Here we, we would represent E as a vector and we use the input vector together with the previous hidden state to produce a new hidden state. And we make the following prediction. So in this time step, we want to model the, the we want the model to predict the letter L, but it predicts here incorrectly um, O. So in this case, it would incur a higher loss. And you would sort of repeat these processes over and over again at multiple times. And if you train this model with many different sequences, then it will learn how to predict the next character in the sequence based on the context of all the previous characters. And as you can see here, we want the network to predict next letter as L and it um, correctly predicts it as L. And we want to finally predict, make the network predict the letter O and it correctly predicts the like letter O here. All right, so what you usually do with these RNNs when you want to train them with backpropagation is that you unfold the computational graph over time. So here on the left is this representation of a recurrent neural network. So you don't have outputs in this case, so it's just an input and a hidden layer. And the hidden layer has this connection to itself, which is represented by this black square here. And this black square basically indicates a time delay. So this time delay means that you feed this information from the hidden state H to itself from the previous time step. So we have these three time steps that is indicated on the right. And we have this input nodes three different times as well as the hidden nodes three different times. So as you see, you have this function F, 
which is then showed here and is the same function at each time step. And if you look at this more into detail, we would have had the weight, weights which are indicated by these bold arrows and each of them are these weights W and these weights would be the same in each time step as well. So the weights W are responsible to propagate the information from one time step to the next. So this is again a parameter sharing scheme, but now it is parameter sharing across time. So we have varying inputs that come into the network at each time step. And we apply the same operation in terms of function mappings at every time step. So in order to compute the hidden state H, we apply a nonlinear activation function such as um, tan H, for example, to the hidden state that we had from the previous time step, which is then H of T minus one. Then we get a new input. And then for this, we have the parameters theta. And at the same thing is done at every input that you get in the network, you always take the hidden state that you had before and then you get some new inputs and then which is then mapped to a uh, same function f here create the next hidden state so if you unroll this we can say that this term here is to be calculated by applying h of t minus 2 and the input x of t minus 1 from the time step and the same parameters theta So a nice property of this is that regardless of the sequence length, the model will have the same input size in terms of the parameters. So you can input sequences of length five, sequences of length seven and so on, but then you have these representations H that is used to compute the output. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this video. I have two questions for you. Can you think of other applications that we did not discuss where RNNs are used? And can we use RNNs to learn from non-sequential data, for example, from an image? So if so, what would be the benefit? Now I encourage you to pause this video and we'll continue in the next one. Thank you.